My name is Alan Smith and I administer the Brian Desmond Hearst estate. His estate was lying in a, wil in a state of wilderness, basically, um, and had never been formalised. I'd gone to the High Court in London in 2009 to formalise the estate because I believed very firmly that Brian needed a voice, that he was an amazing character, an interesting character. His story is almost unbelievable. Uh, so armed with formalising the estate, we've been able to gather in all of the information about his films, the information about his memoirs, and we'll hear a lot more about that in a second, and that was an amazing discovery. And then it's all been woven together, as Brian would have wanted, a visual book, a book that sells the story, that shows his art, and it is a colossal book, it's an amazing book, and it tells the story of Brian Desmond Hurst. Northern Ireland's greatest film director, Ireland's most prolific film director of the 20th century, and arguably the UK's greatest, or one of the UK's greatest war film directors, Brian Desmond Hurst. Hello, I'm Stephen Wyatt, and I helped Brian write his memoirs back in the 1970s, which is a long time ago. Uh, how it came about was that I was a writer newly back in London and my agent suggested to me that this elderly film director was looking for somebody to help with his memoirs. Extraordinarily at that point, I had never heard of Brian and very few people I know had ever heard of Brian. And so one of the important things and gratifying things about publishing this book now is a lot more people know about his achievement and we can learn just how extraordinary his career was. Um, when I went to see Brian, I really didn't know what to expect. Uh, there was this extraordinary figure with wonderful white hair, very strong face, very powerful blue eyes, rather mischievous eyes. There was always a bit of mischief lurking inside Brian's face. And we talked for a little while, we had a glass of wine, and then over the next 18 months, uh, we worked from notes that had already been there and um, explored various aspects of his career. I, at the time, I was sometimes incredulous that these things really happened, and Brian did like a good story, but basically it all really happened. So I'm Caitlin Smith. I'm Brian Desmond's house, three times great niece. Um, I graduated from studying fashion marketing and branding in 2019. And I've always been interested in my great uncle's amazing life and career. So whilst I was on furlough in the first lockdown back in May, um, I just began collecting all of the content for her on film, sorting through lots of film stills, lots of scripts, the original memoirs and researching and deciding what to include in the book. Um, ever since then, I've been working on Hearst on Film and I'm so excited that it's finally out. You can hear Brian's perspective on film from the 1920s to the 1970s and get a bit of an insight into his life. So Stephen's just mentioned the mischievous um, sparkling blue eyes of Brian and and you know we have to face up to it. Brian actually was a little bit of a rogue he was used to getting his own way there are hundreds of stories that are fascinating in the book ranging from on one film set he was told not to turn up in a Rolls Royce because it was too ostentatious so what did Brian do the next day he turned up in his Bentley when he was passing um, Earl Mountbatten on the road in Kinnerton Street where they were near neighbours he would ask Mountbatten how many toilets Mountbatten had, and Mountbatten would signify he had two with a particular hand signal, very cheeky, but that was the banter that they had. And Brian would delight in raising three fingers back to Mountbatten because he had three in his house. This sits massively in contrast to a man that used to pick up bread on the street in Belfast to feed himself because they were in poverty. He then went on to fight in Gallipoli where he lost most of his comrades in one night. 
So it's you start to see the amazing contradictions in the man. And how does this man go on to become one of John Ford's greatest friends and befriend Harry Clifton, one of the richest men in England? The story is amazing. My favourite film is Theirs is the Glory. Brian taking 120 veterans back to Arnhem in late summer 1945. The men would identify the field graves of their comrades that they'd buried a year earlier in September 1944 during the horrific battle. He persuaded them to, 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 to play their best uh, in a major film. And the job is superb. The job is quite simply superb. He got the best out of them. The men wanted to do their best because they didn't want their comrades to be forgotten. The men that were in the graves that died out there. And the film went on to be the biggest grossing war film in the UK for 10 years. That says it all. Uh, one of my favourites is a film called On the Night of the Fire, which was made just before World War II. And it's a very dark film. It's, it's an English film noir. And in that film, you get a very strong sense of both the darkness of Brian and also his fantastic visual sense. He trained as a painter and he started as an art director. And I think that shows in all his films. On the Night of the Fire is set in Newcastle. And as he says in the book, the, the leads played by Ralph Richardson and Diana Wynyard are a pretty unlikely pair for a barber and his wife in Newcastle. But they are fantastic performances. So interestingly, my favourite film of Brian's is On the Night of the Fire as well. I have to say when I first watched it, I just found it so fascinating, the way that he kind of goes into Cobbling's life and how it slowly and slowly gets distracted by this one little thing. I like how it's like so dark as well because um, one of Brian's first films, Telltale Heart, was a really, really dark film. And um, this is also a really dark film. I think that's kind of where he thrives with his work. Uh, Brian had the most extraordinary, ebullient personality as well as this huge sense of mischief. Um, I remember on one occasion I came in and he was quite subdued and I thought, oh dear, is he ill, poor old soul? Not at all. He'd been out at party the night before and had the most colossal hangover. And on that occasion he'd just taken delivery of a large case of champagne as a gift and he handed it to me and said, Stephen, I want you to take this bottle and pour it all over your lover and lick it off. Uh, I'm afraid we just drank the bottle, but that was a very Brian sort of way of, of being. And there is a huge contradiction in him between this life-loving um, bon viveur and the other side to him. Um, a little bit of context just about Brian and, and our family. Um, he'd been pretty much out in the wilderness until the early 60s when my mother went down to, to see him at um, County Kerry on Inch Strand when he was making Playboy of the Western World. She came down and said to the security man, my name is Hurst, was let in, and she brought back Brian and the Belfast family together again. Because I think up until then, Brian had felt he wasn't comfortable coming back to Belfast. He wasn't sure about what was going on there and how he'd be received. He had broken links with the family and, and mum had brought him back into the fold again. He attended mum's wedding and from then on, he was very much part of our family, coming over for Christmas, dressing up as Santa making a theatrical production out of every Christmas. As I then moved on to be a student, I used to go down and visit him. He gave me keys to his house that I could go down and stay in at any time, exceptionally generous. His love of um, fine red wine was always to the fore. His storytelling was always there. It was stories, stories, stories. Filling my head with notions of Tinseltown and John Wayne and John Ford and Roger Moore and Richard Attenborough. And, and sometimes I wondered, was it really all true? 
And I eventually realized that it was, it came together. And I was fortunate enough to go along to his 90th birthday party at BAFTA, where a very small gathering of friends came, came along to recognize him. And he was so pleased that he hadn't been forgotten. It's 90 and years after um, his last film. So, um, and the sort of the people that I met there that day were Alec Guinness, John Mills, uh, Terence Young. Um, a, a load of people had come out to say, Brian, we thought you were great and you really helped our careers. And um, it helped me realize that there was maybe some truth to all the tall tales that we've been told when we were young. And it's all now set out in the book. So I actually never personally knew Brian, but my dad has told me lots of funny stories about him being very eccentric later on in his life. Um, the only memory that I can think of that um, kind of relates to Brian is um, back in 2011, when I was about 14, um, my dad took me to the blue plaque unveiling um, in Belfast. I think Brian was the only person to have two blue plaques un unveiled in one day in Northern Ireland. So yeah, that was really fascinating to witness. Brian uh, was I, sometimes bisexual, but mostly homosexual. He had a very checkered and interesting sexual life. He was never hypocritical um, and he was open in a period in which many other people would not have dared to be open. Um, there's a very interesting conversation in the book with J. Arthur Rank, who is just about to offer him a contract. And J. Arthur Rank says to Brian, you know, I've heard all these rumors about you, my boy. And Brian replied simply, Arthur, I am as God made me. And this was enough for Rank. He didn't ask any more questions. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that this book is going to happen. Uh, I worked with Brian on his memoirs over 40 years ago. And it had many, many wonderful anecdotes about his life, but I didn't feel it would ever stand up on its own as a self-contained book. The bits in between the stories had sort of gone a bit missing by then. So what Caitlin has done, which is wonderful, is she's drawn on the Hearst archive and created a huge visual record of Brian's working life, of his personal life with stills from the show, stills of his personal life, posters, handouts, leaflets. It, it, it's a visual treat. And I think this, together with the memoirs, tells us Brian's extraordinary story and I'm just delighted it's happened. So what I'd say about Hearst on film is that it's definitely very different to a lot of other film director books. Um, it walks you through Brian's career with like images that you'll never see again um, that are part of our personal ar archive that we've handpicked. It's really interesting hearing his perspective on cinema as a whole. The book shows you how amazing Brian was and I'm really passionate about keeping his name in the conversation and spreading the word about him. So I'm hoping this book will be the way that that's done. We've now got a book. It's a colossal book. And it's about a colossal film director. And it's about the human Blarney Stone. So in the 1950s, a particular news article that caught our eye reference Brian as the human Blarney Stone. And a story needs to be told because it's a story that may not have been told had it not been for Stephen, had it not been for us finding the memoir, had it not been for formalizing the estate and being able to bring everything together because it was scattered to the wind, because Brian didn't care about material wealth. If somebody admired something, he gave it away. In the book, you'll read about him giving away a Picasso. I'd love to have the Picasso back if anybody knows where it is, but Brad didn't care. 
He gave away wealth. He came in with nothing. He left with nothing. He converted from an Ulster Covenant signing Protestant in 1912 to Catholicism in 1947. As Stephen said, he was openly gay at a time when he could have easily ended up in prison or worse because he didn't care. Because he had lost his mother and father when he was very young, aged four and 16. His parents had died at those two ages. He'd lost all his friends. He lost his, big, his beloved big brother, who was my great grandfather, in 1917. So the things that he treasured had gone and he didn't care. And so he just got on with life. And what this book does is illustrates an extraordinary career absolutely unbelievable in parts but as Stephen said earlier by and large it's absolutely true so enjoy the book